Hello, and welcome to Mindful Living Week. My name is Kaylee Isaacs. I'm the founder of the Awake Network and the producer of Mindful Living Week. And in this session, we're going to be learning from Ched Ming Tan, who is a Google pioneer, award-winning engineer, international best-selling author, thought leader, and philanthropist, whose work has received eight nominations for the Nobel Peace Prize. In this session, we'll be exploring the connection between mindfulness, calm, and happiness. Thanks so much for joining us, Ming. Thanks for having me. So to start off, could you help us to explore the relationship between mindfulness, calm, and happiness? Mindfulness is defined as moment-to-moment non-judging awareness. <clears throat> so in other words, it is a quality of attention. So it's how to attend, basically attending to the present moment. And when you're attending to the present moment, uh, you are not in the past and not in the future. So to worry, you need to be in the past. To regret, sorry, to worry, you need to be in the future. <laughs> to regret, you need to be in the past. So when you're attending to the present moment intensely, you are free from worry and regret. And that is how, uh, that's one of the ways we calm the mind. That's so that's one way uh, mindfulness relates to calming the mind. The other way is to uh, attending to the body. So uh, when we're having an emotional experience, when we're under stress or, some, or we're angry or something, we are, our body is reacting in various ways, right? That face is tightening, muscles are tightening, uh, blood pressure is going up, and so on, so on and so forth. And we have this vomiting feeling that we are vaguely aware of, but not fully aware. We're just aware that something bad is happening, and then we are reacting. So this person makes me feel this way. This person must be bad. Right? But, so, but when we pay attention to all these body sensations, then we realize, ah, all these things are happening. And because we're paying attention, then we can calm it down. So that's the second way mindfulness relates to calmness. So the next question is, what's the relationship between calmness of mind and happiness? And this is fascinating. So, there is, uh, so, so for me, uh, the way I started was I, I was practicing mindfulness and then calming my mind like on demand. And then suddenly I found this. I find that I was in the place where I was joyful, independent of sensation. So nothing was happening. And I was just filled with joy. Very surprising. And then after a while, I started to be able to do that reliably, which means that every time I sit, in two or three seconds, my whole being was filled with joy. And it did not make any sense. <laughs> so, I was like, <laughs> so after a while, the question becomes, I, I knew the question. The question is, why is it that a calm and clear mind is always joyful? It makes no sense. And one of my teachers uh, gave me a, a Tibetan teacher, gave me a brilliant answer. And he says that the default state of mind is joy. Therefore, when you're calm and clear, you return the mind to default, which is joy. There's no magic. <clears throat> and later on, as I progress in my studies and my practice, I learned something. I learned that there's a word called sukha. So sukha is, uh, in a sense, a non-energetic joy. It's a, it's a pleasantness, right? an all-pervading pleasantness. And it's, it's very subtle. And I'll compare sukha to the air conditioning, the sound air conditioning in the room. Usually you don't hear it. But if you do two things, you calm down, or you quiet down and pay attention, then you can hear the humming. Then realize that it's there all the time. Anytime you want to hear the humming, come, quiet down, pay attention, you can always hear it. It's the same with this quality of mind called sukha. It's always there. So all you have to do is quiet down the mind and pay attention, and we find sukha. Uh, this is very sustainable, quiet joy. And once you can learn to access it, you can access it all the time. And therefore, you have a sustainable source of joy on demand. So that's how mindfulness relates to calmness and joy. You said once you access it, you can uh, more easily access it all the time. And so mm -hmm. could you help us understand a little bit about how our sitting meditation practice, where we might be practicing working with the mind or connecting mm -hmm. with the body, can mm -hmm. actually infiltrate into our daily life where we're not sitting on a cushion anymore? So if you go to the gym <clears throat> and then you've, you've woke up your muscles and your muscles become big, right? And, but if you go out of the gym, uh, after, I mean, after a few weeks of practice, you go out of the gym, you're still strong. <laughs> just because you're out, just because not really doesn't make you any weaker. 
right? So it's the same way of practice. So it begins with, so the dream is a control condition. But through this control condition, then in the real world, we are strong. So the same here, if when you're sitting on a cushion, it's a control condition, like no sound, nobody bothering you, whatever it is, and not too hot, not too cold. <clears throat> then you learn to bring attention to the breath. Every time your attention wanders away, bring it back. Bring it back. Every time you bring it back, it's like doing one bicep curl for the mind. So you bring it back a lot. The mind, specifically the prefrontal cortex, the brain, but the mind and the tension becomes strong. So after a while, you have control over attention. You have, so instead of attention controlling you, you can control attention. You have gain mastery over attention. And after all, you can do this on the cushion like easily because it's a controlled environment. And then once you can do that, when you're doing it in the outside world, you have still some percentage of that ability. Right? So, so the way it manifests is this. So something happened that makes you angry. It triggers you. Then it's like, it's like suddenly you say, you're going to get angry. You're going to say something and you're going to regret very soon. And then my pay attention to the breath, pay attention to the body. And don't say anything for the next two seconds. So that's how the practice from the cushion comes to real life, right? Through, through the ability to uh, calm the mind, deploy attention, attend to the body. Then in the real life, all these things come into play when, when you need it the most. And one example is uh, one of my students who was a former Marine and he was very big size. And, uh, and he said that after taking my class for a few weeks, uh, he was in a situation when something happened and he was about to say something very nasty to his mother-in-law. And th those, the training <laughs> came, came, to the, came to effect, right? Suddenly, he caught himself breathing. Suddenly, he caught himself looking at his body sensations. And then suddenly, he caught himself thinking, don't say anything to his mother-in-law. <laughs> and that changed life. <laughs> and they live happily ever after. <laughs> It seems like some people seem to lean more towards the happy or joyful side and some people have a harder time with that or, or um, might get triggered more easily. Mm -hmm. I've heard you speak about a concept called baseline happiness. Mm -hmm. Could you share a little bit about that with us as well? Mm -hmm. The concept is this, and it's been uh, verified by various studies, which is that we all have our own baseline happiness, which is if nothing is happening, how happy are you? So most people are kind of eh. Some people, when nothing's happening, they're yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people, they're depressed. So there's a, there's a, a, a spectrum, right? A, a, dis, a normal distribution. And the this, this fascinating study, part of the study is that whatever happens to you, eventually you, do, you return to the baseline. So if something really good happens to you, you, you win the lottery, you win $10 million, yay. You're so happy. And after a few weeks, shh, back to baseline. And then or something very really bad happened. And then again, according to the research, like uh, you become paralyzed paraphagic, right? what's the word? Yeah, you lose all the sensation in the body. They get very depressed for a few months, shh, come back to baseline. It's fascinating. So uh, <clears throat> for, for me, when I grew up, I, I, my baseline happiness was very low. I was like depressed like all the time. And so for me, I found that, uh, I found meditation and I found, I found mindfulness, I found uh, Buddhism. And the, the story was this. The story was I was attending a talk by a Tibetan uh, Buddhist nun, Venerable Sanke Kato. She's from America. She's a, from LA, a white woman, speaking in Singapore. And in the middle of a the talk, there was one, one sentence. She said, it's all about cultivating the mind. I had my like, that moment. And then I was like, everything in my life suddenly made sense. Like, everything made sense. And I told myself, from this moment on, right here, right now, I'm a Buddhist. And I'm going to learn meditation, no matter how hard it is. I, I had a sense somehow that that was the way out of my misery. And I didn't really know it, but I, I roughly knew. And it was strong enough that I made a determination. And so I practiced uh, mindfulness for a few years. And then a few years later, I, I was just taking a walk and I suddenly discovered that I was happy. It was like my baseline has moved from depressed to happiness. Like nothing happening, I was happy. And I reflected back, I was like, wow, this practice changed my baseline. From someone who was always on the verge of wanting to like, take his own life to someone who is always happy. And that's when I decided, this is it. If I can do it, anybody can do it. If everybody does it, it creates a conditions for world peace. And so that's when I decided to spend the rest of my life making this understandable, accessible, and practicable to everybody. It seems like 
we often think of the things that are going to make us happy as being maybe material gain or success at work or in life. Uh, but you seem to be describing uh, a different circumstance where our baseline happiness is affected by something more fundamental. Uh, mm -hmm. you've, you've had some great success in your own life, um, being a pioneer at Google very early on. I'm wondering how you define success personally. Mm -hmm. So the way I define success is the same as everybody else's, which is that there is what you want to achieve and that having achieved it, that is success. I think the difference is that uh, myself, I think most Buddhists would do the same, is one of those things includes nothing. <laughs> Achieving nothing. And the extreme case is this, and it's, it sounds like comedy. The extreme case, uh, the Buddha had this disciple called Sariputta. And Sariputta was the wisest of all of Buddha's disciples. So Sariputta was living with a bunch of monks, and then he was, it was, he just was in the state of Nirvana and so on, and he came out of it, and he said something. He said, ah, happiness is this Nirvana, happiness is this Nirvana. So one of, one of his fellow monks, I think his name is Udayi, uh, asked this question. He said, friend Sariputta, in Nirvana, there's nothing. Where is the happiness? And Sariputta said, in Nirvana, there's nothing, precisely where the happiness is. <laughs> so to so, so a Buddhist, nothing is one of the things that you can, that are criteria for success. So is there a difference between joy and happiness? Mm -hmm. uh, so the, this, the difference is definition. So the, the problem with this field is that the terms are not very well defined. Right? So some of them use joy, happiness, well-being in different ways. And that's why if you hear the experts talk, you get confusing. So wait, does, does well-being lead to happiness, happiness to well-being? I couldn't tell. And the reason I couldn't tell is because they use different definitions. So the, the definition of happiness that I use comes from Matthew Ricard. Right, because he's the happiest man in the world, right? You figure he knows something. And the definition he used for happiness is, is a, a deep sense of flourishing that arises from an exceptionally healthy mind. Right? Not a mood, not a feeling, not an emotion, but an optimal state of being. So that's how he defines it. And one way to see it is that the way he defines it is that it's, it's through a period of time. So you say if a happy day, if a happy uh, life or whatever it is, right? And then, so you look back and you say, okay, not every moment is, is good, but most of them are good and therefore I had a happy day. <clears throat> joy in contrast, and the way I define it, joy is moment to moment, positive, pleasant emotion. That feeling of pleasantness, ah, that is joy. It is an emotion, it is fleeting, it is a feeling. And the relationship between the two is this is that, as I said earlier, happiness uh, is not every moment is joyful. However, there's no such thing as joyless happiness. Right? The, the whole day, there's no joy at all. You don't say, ah, just a happy day. <laughs> so therefore, joy is the building block of happiness. So therefore, uh, to solve the problem of happiness, to be happy, the, the main skill that's needed is the ability to access joy on demand. You can access that, then you can you create a building blocks for happiness. And how does one go about doing that? Hmm. So in my book, I talk about three, about three practices. Oh, I like three. three my, coffee, my coffee is three in one. <laughs> um, so the first is calming the mind. So talk about what we talked about earlier, right? When the mind is calm and you can do it on demand, I mean, besides like, changing your life, besides your changing your relationship with the mother-in-law, right? something else happened, which is that you create the ability to access joy on demand. And this joy is independent of sensory and ego pleasure. So there are, you talked about, you alluded this, to this earlier, <clears throat> there are usually two sources of joy, and they are valid sources. The first valid source of joy is sense, as pleasant sensation, senses. So good taste, good sight, beautiful sight, and good feeling, then you feel joyful. The second one is a uh, pleasant ego, right? Some, somebody looks up to you, you know, introduces you as you know, somebody who would not know about this, but whatever, you say, yeah, that ego is fluffed up, that you feel good about yourself, or you accomplished something, or it's something meaningful, you did I mean, then you fluff up your ego, right? So these two are the sources of joy, and these are good. But what's the problem? The problem, uh, there are two problems. The first one is impermanence which is whatever pleasantness you have, it will go away. <clears throat> and uh, 
the source of your goal. I mean, you'll die, right? Your body will break down and so on. So whatever pleasantness of body, taste, whatever, they will go away, right? So that's one. The second one is even worse, is habituation. It's that like whatever pleasantness you experience now, eventually you'll, you need even more stimulus to have the same level of happiness. So like you start a job, for example, right? and then you got promoted to manager. Hey, it was fluff up. And then three months later, I'm not director. My life sucks. <laughs> and I can promote the director and so on. I'm not VP. My life sucks. There's a trade new. It can never get to the end. So these are the two problems of, of us joy arising from those sources. So they're not bad sources, but because of those problems, they're unsatisfactory. And in, in Buddhism, the word unsatisfactory is dukkha. Like this. It's a, because it's unsatisfactory, it's a source of future suffering. And the, the, sort of, the, type of source, the type of joy that I talked about is less, is independent of those things, of fluffiness of ego and of pleasant sensation. You just sit down there and you're happy. Right? And that's life changing because you don't, you don't have to do all those things anymore. You can be happy and then you can do all those things. Right? So, so that's one. The second step is to incline the mind towards joy. And the word inclination, in, in the old, uh, in the, if you look at the old Buddhist scriptures, the, the Buddha uh, compared the inclination of a mind to inclination of a mountain, to a slope of a mountain. So the mountain is thrown in a certain way. When the water flows, it flows effortlessly in this direction. When tree falls, it tree falls effortlessly in this direction. And so the Buddha said the inclination of the mind is the same. Right? If the mind is inclined towards a certain thing, then experiences flow effortlessly there. So you're inclined towards anger. You're effortlessly angry. And but you're inclined towards joy. Then you're effortlessly joyful, a lot. So the question becomes, how do you change inclination of mind towards joy? And there's a surprisingly easy and pleasant practice, which is just to notice thin slices of joy. So an example of thin slices of joy, I've been talking for a while, I'm a little bit thirsty and it's allergy season. So I drink some water. And when I drink water, I have a thin slice of joy in two dimensions, space and time. It's thin in space because it wasn't like, yay. It was like, eh, it's kind of nice. It's pleasant. And it was, like, it lasted, the pleasantness lasted for two or three seconds. And so because of that, we miss all those things all the time. Right? We don't think of this as a joyful experience. And then because of that, our life said, my life is joyless. But now when you start like noticing, oh, that moment, I have three seconds of a little bit of joy. And then when I see a new friend, I meet a new friend, I have a, a real joy. When I see an old friend, I have a real joy. And so on and so forth. And then we start noticing, you start noticing a lot and start realizing, oh my, there's a lot of joyful moments in the day, every day. From the moment I wake up, I'm not in pain right now. I, I have another 24 hours, so on and so forth. And that inclines the mind towards joy. So that's the second step. The third step, I think even more powerful, is to uplift the mind, specifically with uh, hard qualities, love and compassion, kindness and compassion, rather. Uh, can we do an experiment? <clears throat> so experiment, uh, I encourage this, all of you listeners to do that. Uh, bring to mind somebody you care about, and just think, I wish for this person to be happy. You notice when you're doing that, you're smiling, right? To wish for somebody to be happy, to be, by the way, this practice is called loving kindness. To be on the giving end of a kind thought is intrinsically rewarding. It's fascinating, right? And it's, it's a reliable experience. Every time you, you do that, every time you think, I wish for that person to be happy, you yourself become a little bit happier. And that is one of the most powerful secrets of happiness. Like nothing changes. Like not a single thing in life changes. All you do is just, Think, wish for this person to be happy, randomly, and you're happier. So <clears throat> how powerful is this? So one time I gave a talk on a Monday evening, uh, I spirit rock, and the audience is about 100 people. And then I, I say, okay, tomorrow is Tuesday. So we did this experiment. I said, tomorrow is Tuesday. Try this. Every hour on the hour, when you go back to work, spend 10 seconds wishing for two people randomly outside the office, wish for them to be happy. And don't say anything, just think. So it's not embarrassing. Okay? And then go back to work. Right? Nobody knows what you're thinking. Right? Don't embarrass yourself and so on. See what happens. So uh, that was Monday evening. Uh, Wednesday morning, I received email from a total stranger. 
And this woman said, they say, I hate my job. I hate coming to work every single day. But I did the homework on Tuesday, and Tuesday was my happiest day in seven years. Happiest day in seven years. What do you think? It took 80 seconds of thinking. And this, this, uh, this uh, practice of loving kindness, compassion, is also good for your soul, also good for practice, in addition to happiness. To, to happiness. So I recommend this for everybody. So three practices. The first is calming the mind and then accessing joy through a calm mind. The second is inclining the mind towards joy by noticing thin slices of joy. And the third is uplifting the mind with hard qualities like kindness and compassion. So that's it. Good for your soul, good for happiness, good for your practice. And yeah, there's no downside to any of those things. Thank you for sharing those. Those are very helpful. Mm. I'm wondering if we could also explore a little bit the maybe the other side of things we've been talking about, joy. And when there might be very, when we might sit down on the cushion and be meet, met with um, very challenging thoughts or emotions or in our everyday life where maybe we're taking time to appreciate um, the the feeling of drinking water or the, the sight of a, a bird in the tree, um, but we might also have very challenging and painful situations happening. What's mm -hmm. the connection between joy and pain? <clears throat> there was a period where I was in, in intense pain and it was prolonged. It was after I had, I had the joy practice. And I realized something in that experience. I realized that joy and pain are mutually insoluble which means they don't dissolve each other. So, so what does that mean, right? So, uh, so the way I, I tell you the way I experienced it and then the insight. The way I experienced it was this, was I was like intense pain, I, I was like, I'll die, I'll die, I'll die. And then suddenly I'll know nowhere, I'll be joyful. I'll be like unadulterated joy. The sky, the, the weather is so beautiful, I'm so happy for about five minutes. <laughs> and then I'm back to, I'm so happy, I'm so depressed, I'm so depressed. I was like, I, I must be going crazy. Right? And the question I ask myself is this, if my pain is so intense, why doesn't it dissolve away the joy? Or if the joy is so intense, why doesn't it dissolve away the pain? Yet they're mutually insoluble. They exist side by side. Right? So that was my, my insight. And so that insight, uh, it was very powerful because it, it gives us the possibility that even in experiences of intense pain, we can, through our practice, bring about moments of joy here and there. And because of that, we, it's, like, it's like traveling a vast ocean, a vast a desert, and you have oasis here and there. And because of the oasis, then you can get to the other end. If there's no oasis, you'll die. And this joy practice allows us to do that. And I can tell you, do you have time for a story? Okay, so the, the person that for me most embodies this, <clears throat> is this woman called Rigoberta Manchu. And uh, she's a Nobel Peace Prize winner. She's, she's Mayan. And um, the first, so if you have any idea, I mean, if you have any stereotype of what a so Nobel Peace Prize winner is, you imagine this person must be very kind, very warm, very nice, always happy. <laughs> imagine. <laughs> Otherwise, they would give her a Nobel Peace Prize, right? And uh, uh, not always true, by the way. <laughs> I met a lot of them. Uh, however, Rico Berta fits that stereotype to a T. Right? You meet her for the first time, she, she's, she is very warm, she is very kind, she is always happy, and so so far. It's like, wow, this is like what I imagine the Nobel Peace Prize winner to be like, such a wonderful human being. So I spent some time with her, and then uh, an hour of spending time with her, I see the other side of her, which is that below this, uh, right underneath this joy, is immense amount of pain. There's a lot of pain. And, and the, the, the reason, so in the case of Rigoberta, her father was murdered. Uh, specifically, her father was burned alive. Her mom was uh, beaten, tortured, raped, and then murdered, and left on the streets to feed wild animals. And then she lost her brother in a similar way. She lost her son. And so her life was traumatic. Right? And by the way, Nobel Peace Prize winners, that is not unusual. They went through a lot of trauma. That's why they, and they came out a good human being. That's why they won a Nobel Peace Prize. And so uh, I look at her life and I was like, if any one of those things happened to me, I'd be like scarred for life. 
and she has all that, and she's genuinely joyful, caring, compassionate, and so on and so forth, right? and, and warm, and while carrying that pain at the same time. It's fascinating. And so I got to know her a bit more. I realized this. I realized that the, the metaphor I use, that, that she, that, that she uh, puts joy and pain together. The metaphor that I will use is putting a cast around a leg. So if you break your leg, your bones are broken, put a cast around it. It does two things. The first thing it does is it contains the damage. So it doesn't damage your, 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 your leg further. The second thing it does is allows time to heal. And it's the same that Rigoberta does. Right? She uses her joy to contain all the pain. And through doing that, she limits damage and she allows healing to happen over time. So I think to me, that is a relationship between joy and pain. Thank you for sharing that. And powerful, right? Really, yeah. Yeah. I think it's I think it's obvious to us why joy is something that we would want to cultivate in our lives and why it's helpful. Mm. And as you were describing the the trend of uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners as often having had a lot of pain in their lives, I'm wondering mm. uh, if you could talk a little bit about what we might have to learn from from the pain or the challenges in our life. Mm. Uh, there are two levels of it. So the first level is um, if you need struggle to, to grow, but you cannot have too much struggle. Then otherwise, if not only won't grow, you will die. And, and the very nice uh, analogy is, is a, a butterfly. So during metamorphosis, the last stage of the metamorphosis process, the caterpillar bursts out of the cocoon and becomes a butterfly. And it turns out that the bursting out, there's a struggle, and the struggle is really important. But it's through the struggle that the, the, the fluids come out of the wing and so on and so forth, and then the wings become full, full bloom. For, so therefore, for example, if you try to be compassionate, you try to cut the cocoon for the butterfly, it will not fly because it didn't have the process of struggle that it needs to grow. But however, if the cocoon was too hard, it would not be able to break out and it would die. Right? So in life, I think a right, there's such thing as the right amount of struggle. <laughs> enough struggle to grow, but not enough to kill you. Uh, however, we also grow in capacity. So over time, through our practices, uh, our ability to handle more struggle and therefore grow more increases. <clears throat> so that's one level. There's another level, and now I'm speaking to the fellow Buddhists. And, but even for non-Buddhists, this is relevant. Uh, the two words I'm going to introduce to you, uh, my Buddhist friends, uh, Sambhaga and Pasada. And these two words are very important for practice. So samvega means uh, the, the realization that life as is the way we live it will only lead to suffering. There is no happiness here. And, and there's a fascinating word uh, in, in, in the Buddhist text, uh, Nibida, which means not to be found and usually translated as disenchanted. And the, the analogy that Buddha gave, Buddha gives fascinating analogies. Buddha gave the energy, a dog, find a bone. So the bone is left on the sun for many years. So it's completely dry. There's nothing there. But the dog sees it. Oh, there's a bone. The dog bites into it. And at first, it's saliva. It's all saliva. It's oh, a juicy bone. And after a few minutes, wait a minute, there's nothing here. And the dog says, ah, I'm leaving. And Buddha said, there's the same with a wise man looking at ah, sensual desire. Right? If there's a well, unwise man, says, oh, bone. But a wise man says, there's nothing here. I'm like moving on. So some vega is this thing, once your, your practice reaches a certain place, you find that life is impermanent, life has so much suffering, and life is like this. Whatever we do, we will hit the suffering, except if we, go, if we uh, reach nirvana. There's only one exception. And <clears throat> so because of that, uh, some vega usually translated as urgency, but it's not really urgency. Some vega leads to urgency. So what's the problem with Sambhaga? The problem with Sambhaga is it's very depressing, right? So if all you have is Sambhaga, you think like, oh, I, well, <laughs> I will suffer. <laughs> My life will lead to suffer, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you, will, you will get depressed. And during the Buddha's lifetime, there were monks who were so strong in Sambhaga, but they're not strong in their own practice, they started killing themselves. And so the Buddha had to go to them and try to talk to them about their, strengthen their practice. <clears throat> so there's a flip side to that. The flip side is something called Pasada, P-A-S-A-D-A. 
The sadha is the confidence in the teaching of the Buddha and also confidence in the practice and the dharma. Right? So uh, it balances out some bigger. If you have some bigger, but you also have a sadha. You say, okay, life is all this suffering, but I have this practice. So I'm fine. And if together, some bigger gives you the motivation to practice. Oh, by the way, that's, that's the flip side. The flip side, if you only have a sadha, you know some bigger, what happens? Complacency. Eh, I fact, this is nice, but everything is good now. And it happened to a king uh, during the Buddha's lifetime. This king who is a student of the Buddha and so on. So he's obviously a lot of Pasada. Pas Pasada. There's no Sambhaga because he's king. He's enjoying life. <clears throat> so one day the Buddha talked to him. He said, Your Majesty, what if the scouts from the south came back and said, The mountains from the south are moving towards us. And the scouts from the north said, The mountains are not moving towards us. And the east and the west. And eventually, the mountains will move and they'll crush you to death. There's nothing you can do about it. What will you do? And King said, oh my God, I will, I will, I will do my practice now. <laughs> and the Buddha said, how is that different from impending death? Okay. And that woke him up because he didn't have some bigger. So he didn't have motivation. So some bigger and Bersada together motivates you to practice. So the struggle side of it, the pain side, is the some bigger side. Have to be balanced with Bersada. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for your time today. I'm wondering if uh, there might be a guided practice that you could lead us through. I'm very, very lazy. So I'm going to do just a <laughs> <laughs> one breath practice. Uh, in this practice, all I want you to do is pay total and gentle attention to one in-breath and one out-breath beginning now. And thank you for your attention. You notice that in one breath, already a karma. Mm. Yeah. So it doesn't take a lot. Uh, there is a very nice uh, analogy. I think it's also a Tibetan analogy. Analogy of the perfume. If you have very strong perfume, you open it for a few seconds, you close it back, the whole room smells nice for a long time. So by your weak perfume, you have to keep it open for a long time. So same with your practice. If, if you're intense, like, Remember I say intense but gentle attention to this breath. If it's intense, then the calmness will be very strong and can stay for quite a while. But if you are if you like, eh, then there's not much benefit. So I, would, I recommend lots of short, intense practices throughout the day. Maybe you at least once an hour for five seconds or more than that. Thank you. And as, as we come to a close, if there was one thing that you'd like everyone watching to remember from what we spoke about today or from your work in general, what would that be? Loving kindness. So uh, every day, spend at least one, at least a few seconds uh, just wishing for a random person in your head, wishing for somebody to be happy. Thank you so much, Ming. Thanks for having me. <laughs>